Well, good morning, everybody. So great to see you. If you have your Bible, grab it and let's go to Proverbs chapter 7. Proverbs chapter 7 this morning. The church born into the ancient Roman Empire was born into a world that was filled with sexual confusion, chaos, and indulgence. The the church was born into a world characterized by sexual confusion, chaos, and indulgence. I I had this really driven home to me a number of years ago. About 10 years ago, my family had this incredible privilege uh, to travel and visit the ancient ruins of the city of Pompeii. Pompeii, a a first century Roman um, city that was buried under ash after the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. On this trip, we actually got to visit some other sites. We got to visit ancient Ephesus. And when you go to Ephesus, they, they point out, like, the, the, here's, a, here's a, an ancient house, and it's like just a, a pile of rocks in a square. You go to Pompeii, and you, like, take your pick of which house you want to walk through. It's an it's a, uh, incredibly well-preserved first-century Roman city because it was discovered and excavated with so much that was left intact after centuries of being buried under ash. And so as my family and I began to make our way through this tour, uh, we came to a point in the tour where the tour guide stopped us and and she said, you know, um, the next part of the tour is the part that gets really crowded. And I would like to actually avoid that, avoid the crowd and go a different direction and take you to something else that I think you'll find even more interesting. Because the next part of the tour, the really crowded part of the tour, is the tour through the brothel. And, And the next thing she said, I remember my jaw just kind of dropped, she said, if you want to see the pictures, you can see them in the gift shop. And I'm going, pictures. Because you see, in the ruins of the ancient brothel, on the walls is ancient first century pornography, where essentially a customer could come into the brothel and, and, and pick from the menu, the picture menu on the walls. And so she says, if you want to see the pictures, you can see them in the books in the gift shop. And the thing is, is that the people in our group said, no, 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 we want to go see the brothel. And I'm going, pictures, wait, nobody told me this was an R-rated tour. But the the people in our group overrode the better judgment of the tour guide, and she said, okay, we'll we'll go see the brothel. And and, and I walked up alongside her, I said, I said, ma'am, I have my kids with me. My oldest was 10 at the time. I said, ma'am, I have my kids with me. Can can we can we just wait? And uh, meet up with you when you come out. She says, no, we're not coming back this way. It's like, ma'am, my kids are with me. And she says, don't worry, they won't understand. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Right, so we get down there to where the brothel is. And and turns out, sure, enough that throughout this tour, there's just scattered other groups here and there. But when we got down by the brothel, it's just like completely crowded because everybody wants to see it. And there's just people everywhere. And thankfully, the, the uh, tour guide, when she saw the crowd, made the executive decision just to lead us through and out to the other side. So we're like pressing through, trying to get to the other side. And she takes us around the corner and up the road just a little bit. She stops to wait on the rest of the group to get to where she is. And then as we're waiting for the rest of the group, she, she points down to the, the street in front of us. And there, carved into the street, is a phallic symbol. It's a directional aid to find the brothel. And in that moment, in that experience, I was reminded that the world in which the church was born was a world filled with sexual confusion, chaos, and indulgence. My question is, Does any of that sound remotely familiar? The reality is we find ourselves in the midst of a world filled with sexual confusion, chaos, and indulgence. And I think it's really important from the get-go to point out that the early church did not win over their world by condemning the indulgence, confusion, and chaos around them. They won over their world by embodying a better way. The early church lived out a counter-cultural sexual ethic. And they didn't see it as their job to police anyone else's sexuality, but to faithfully live out and embody their own. 
They didn't waste their time wagging their fingers at the world around them. They focused their attention instead on living a better way. They were especially concerned not to become fixated on other people's sexual brokenness and avoid paying attention to their own. How much damage do we do to the Christian witness when we condemn the world for failing to live by our sexual ethic while actually failing to live up to our own ethic as well. We do better to focus less on the world's sexual brokenness and more on our own sexual faithfulness. So there may be some of you that heard we were gonna talk about sex this week. And maybe, just maybe, you thought coming in that you were hoping for some good denunciation of what's happening in the world around us. But I think we go wrong when we spend all our time shaking our finger at the world and not looking at ourselves. That God has called us to live, to embody a better way. In this series called Paths to Peace, we've been camping out this summer in the wisdom literature. We spent several weeks walking through the Psalms and the way the Psalms point us to the wisdom of God that brings peace to our lives. And then now we're in the second week of a kind of three-week mini-series on the Proverbs. And, uh, and when I thought about this idea of coming to the Proverbs and spending three weeks on the whole book of Proverbs, how, how do we even approach that? And my mind went back to a great book that was written a number of years ago now, nearly four decades ago, called The Challenge of the Disciplined Life from Richard Foster. And in that book, he talks about three big challenges that all of us, every human being deals with, but especially those of us who are Christians, that we have to think about how we address with the wisdom of God. That is money, sex, and power. Listen to the words of Foster once again. He says, the crying need today is for people of faith to live faithfully. This is true in all spheres of human existence, but it's particularly true with reference to money, sex, and power. No issues touch us more profoundly or more universally. No themes are more inseparably intertwined. No topics cause more controversy. No human realities have greater power to bless or to curse. No three things have been more sought after or in more need of a Christian response. And if that was true nearly 40 years ago, right, as my kids call it, the late 1900s, how much more true is that for us today? And so I came to the book of Proverbs to say, does does the the book of Proverbs, the wisdom of God, have anything to say to us about money, sex, and power? And turns out, these are, in fact, three of the most prominent themes in this book. So last week, we talked about money. And if you weren't here, if you weren't a part of that, I'd just encourage you to go listen to the podcast or go watch the video online on YouTube. But this week, we're talking about sex, about living faithfully according to God's wisdom for our sexuality. And I think it's important just to acknowledge right up front that in this room today, we have teenagers, a number of students who are here with us in the room. We have single adults that have never been married. We have married people, divorced people, widowed people. We have people who have experienced the pain of sexual violation. We have people who are caught in the web of sexual addiction. We have people who struggle with questions about their identity, attractions, or gender. People who are involved in or on a road toward extramarital affairs. People who are struggling with questions regarding sexual boundaries in a dating relationship. And people who are just feeling a sense of deep loneliness. To all of you, we're glad you're here. That I believe that there's no better place to be on this journey than in the community of Jesus. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we're all on this continuing journey to what it means for us to trust God with our sexuality, to surrender our sexuality, to the wisdom of God. 
This morning, we're going to look at this passage from Proverbs chapter seven and then one short passage from the New Testament that I think is gonna give us some help, some wisdom. And my task this morning is fairly straightforward. I have four simple sentences that by the time we finish today, I wanna convince you of the truth of. And, and the thing is that these four sentences are, are so simple, so straightforward that to, to almost seem trite. And yet, underneath each of these four sentences, profound truth that I believe truly has the capacity to change our lives when it comes to living according to God's wisdom for our sexuality. So I'm gonna give you the four sentences right up front. Don't, don't tune out the rest of the time because I wanna tell you what's underneath each of them. But the four sentences right up front. God is good. Temptation is powerful. We are vulnerable. And help is here. Right, by the time that you walk out today, I, I wanna convince you of the truth and the, the capacity of each of those truths to really change our lives. God is good. Temptation is powerful. We are vulnerable. Help is here. Look with me at Proverbs chapter seven. We're gonna go through this whole chapter. What we have in Proverbs seven is actually very different than what you find throughout the remainder of the book of Proverbs. Most of the book of Proverbs, you have these sort of short, pithy little standalone statements that, that um, articulate some kind of truth or wisdom from God. What we have in Proverbs seven is actually one extended block of wisdom, and it comes to us from the sage, from the, the author of Proverbs, directed to his son about living according to God's wisdom with regard to his sexuality. Let's begin in verse one. My son, keep my words and store up my commands within you. Keep my commands and you will live. Guard my teaching as the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers, write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. To insight, you are my relative. They will keep you from the adulterous woman, from the wayward woman with her seductive words. So what we have here is the, the sage, the wise one, the, speaking to his son. And it's as though the sage takes his son by the shoulders and says, listen, we gotta have a talk. I, we, we, we gotta have the talk. And I want you to listen to me. I desperately want you to listen to me because I love you. And I want what's best for you. Now, there's something here that we've got to notice, we've got to point out before we go any further in this text in order to really see what's going on here. And that is this idea of personification. That in this little section, you saw personification of both wisdom and sexual temptation. Right, the, the personification of wisdom, say wisdom is my sister, have a close relationship with wisdom. But then also the personification of sexual temptation as the adulterous woman. I, I point out this idea of personification just because we need to recognize that the Bible is not saying that women are inherently a threat to men's sexual fidelity. Right, the Bible is not saying that, that, that men are just, they're all innocent and that women are all the seductresses. The Bible here is not being misogynistic. What we have is the personification of sexual temptation on display as the adulterous woman. Because this is a, a, an address from a father to a son. But the wisdom embedded in this passage is for both men and women. It's per, per, presented here to us as a father to son. And what he's saying is, listen to me, because what I'm gonna tell you, it's good for you. I love you. I want what's best for you, and this is good for you because it's wisdom that comes from God. And God is good and can be trusted. And I think this is one of the first things that we have to say with regard to talking about our sexuality, is that God is good and can be trusted. The fact of the matter is, is entering into a relationship with God, coming into the Christian faith, begins by trusting God with our eternal salvation. That's the first point, but the reality is the rest of our lives is coming to trust God with the rest of our lives. And one of the ways that many struggle to do that is actually trusting God with regard to their sexuality. 
I think sometimes we have this twisted conception as though God is somehow anti-sex or anti-pleasure, right? It's like, it's like he tolerates it for the procreation of the species, right? But other than that, God is really kind of anti-sex and anti-pleasure. And to that, we need to say, no, that's, that's heresy. Sex is God's idea, that it is a good gift that comes from him, that, that God has designed our bodies with the capacity to experience sexual pleasure, sexual delight. It's his idea in the first place. The thing is, he's just smarter than we are about it, right? Because we sort of sometimes think that our ways are better than God's ways. God is not anti-sex or anti-pleasure. Sex is for us a good gift from God, but like fire, it's a good gift of God when it's in um, constrained, when it's, when, it's in, when it's contained, right? That just as fire, uncontained, has the capacity to destroy, so too our sexuality, when it's outside of the constraints that God has given us, has deep capacity to damage or to destroy. God is just smarter than we are about it. See, here's what God knows. God knows that sex is powerful. Sex is powerful. No no, no more powerful force to bond a man and a woman. God knows that sex is powerful, and therefore, it needs something stronger than itself to contain it. And that's why God has given us that constraint of our sexuality to be expressed within the context of the permanent covenant of marriage. Because sex is powerful, it needs something stronger than itself to contain it. Sex is intended by God to be the physical expression of self-giving, life-uniting love where ultimate vulnerability and ultimate safety meet and embrace. Let me say that again, listen carefully. Sex is intended by God to be the physical expression of self-giving, life-uniting love, where a sense of ultimate vulnerability and ultimate safety meet and embrace. Sex is intended first to be an expression of self-giving love. And, and, And sin has twisted that so that oftentimes we make our sexuality about ourselves, about our own pursuit of pleasure and satisfaction. And yet sex is intended by God to be an expression of self-giving, life-uniting, bonding a a, a man and a woman together in in ways that God says is is one flesh, self-giving, life-uniting love where a sense of ultimate vulnerability that there's really nothing more vulnerable than to be naked with another person. Ultimate vulnerability and ultimate safety. The context of the permanent covenant of marriage is the context of safety, where vulnerability and safety meet and embrace. And as a pastor, I think it's just important for me to point out this morning that some of you are in relationships right now where you're being asked for that kind of, of vulnerability without being offered that context of safety. And I point that out not to shame you, but just to say God has something better for you. God is good and can be trusted. And if we can trust him with our eternal salvation and we can trust him with our finances and we can trust him with our future, we can trust him with our sexuality. God is good. Second, temptation is powerful. Look back at Proverbs 7, beginning of verse six. The sage says, at the window of my house, I looked down through the lattice and I saw among the simple, I noticed among the young men, a youth who had no sense. I love that. He was going down the street near her corner, right? The her, that is the, 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 uh, the seductive woman. He's going down the street near her corner, walking along in the direction of her house. 
At twilight, as the day was fading, as the dark of night set in, then out came a woman, the woman, to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. She is unruly and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares, and every corner she lurks. And she took hold of him and she kissed him. And with a brazen face, she said, today I fulfilled my vows. I have food from my fellowship offering at home. So I came out to meet you. I looked for you. I found you. I've covered my bed with colored linens from Egypt. I've perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let's drink of love till morning. Let's enjoy ourselves with love. My husband is not at home. He has gone on a long, long journey. He took his purse and filled with money and will not be home till full moon. This is the sage painting a powerful picture of seduction. Temptation is powerful. She says, my husband's out of town. I, I, I'm all cleaned up just for you. I, I've got um, soft sheets on my comfortable bed. I've got a scrumptious meal for us to enjoy. I've got the candles lit. I've got Marvin Gaye, let's get it on, playing in the background. <laughs> the Gen Z folks are going, who's Marvin Gaye? <laughs> Look it up on Spotify, trust me. Anyway, um, this is a powerful picture of seduction. And it's the sage's way of saying, you will experience sexual temptation. And it's gonna be strong. Don't be naive about it. He's saying, son, your appetites will be strong. God made you with those appetites. And they're not bad, but they are powerful. And here's what you have to know. You must learn to control your appetites or your appetites will control you. you you've got desires, you've got appetites and, and they are real and they are strong and you must learn to control your appetites or your appetites will control you you. And here's another aspect of all this that I think we have to face head on. And that is the reality that if it's true that God made us with powerful appetites and it's true that God has an enemy at work in the world that's out to undermine his good intention at every turn, what do you think he's going to try to exploit? Christopher West in his book, Theology of the Body for Beginners, captures this idea powerfully. He says this. He says, ponder this for a moment. If the body and sex are meant to proclaim our union with God, there's a deeper meaning to our sexuality. If the body and sex are, are meant to proclaim our union with God, and if there's an enemy who wants to separate us from God, what do you think he's going to attack? And then this profound line. If you want to know what is most sacred in the world, just look at that which is most violently profaned. And I know it may seem a little old fashioned, a little unsophisticated to talk about God having an enemy at work in the world. And yet this line rings so true. If you wanna know what is most sacred, just look at that which is most violently profaned. I don't think we have to look long and hard to find the ways in which human sexuality in this broken, fallen world has been, in fact, violently profaned. Our sexuality is sacred, and it is powerful, and the enemy of God hates that, and he wants to exploit it, and he'll do anything he can to corrupt it, which leads us then to this third truth. First, God is good. Second, temptation is powerful. Third, we are vulnerable. We are all vulnerable. Once again, we need not be naive about it. The, the proverb picks up in verse 21. With persuasive words, she led him astray. She seduced him with her smooth talk. And all at once, he followed her like an ox going to the slaughter. 
like a deer stepping into a noose till an arrow pierces his liver, like a bird darting into the snare, little knowing that it will cost him his life. Now then, my son, listen to me. Pay attention to what I say. Do not let your hearts turn after her ways or stray into her paths. Many are the victims that she has brought down. Her slain are a mighty throng. Her house is a highway to the grave, leading down to the chambers of death. Sexual temptation has brought down many of the mighty. Because we're all vulnerable to be, to be led like an ox to the slaughter. And I think that's actually a really powerful, insightful metaphor, an ox being led to slaughter. The fact of the matter is the one leading the ox isn't nearly as big or as strong as the ox is. Right? An ox is big, an ox is strong. The way you lead an ox to slaughter is to convince the ox that where he is going and what he is doing is where he wants to go and what he wants to do. And so the ox is led where he wants to go, what he wants to do, ultimately leading to his own destruction. This is the sage's way of saying to his son, son, we are all vulnerable. There are a myriad of ways in which we are vulnerable and each probably have our own sort of unique vulnerabilities in this regard. But I wanna just offer you three things that I have seen repeatedly in my attempts to try to help people with their own sexuality and even in in my own journey of pursuing sexual fidelity. Three ways in which our vulnerability shows up over and over again. The first is, as we suggested, our appetites can be strong, right? Sometimes we're vulnerable because our appetites can be strong. God made us with these desires and the desires themselves are not bad. The desires are good, but sin distorts Desire. And here's the thing about appetites. Appetites aren't ever fully satisfied. Right? Appetites aren't ever fully satisfied. And yet we can believe the lie that this will satisfy me, that this thing, this activity, or this person, right? We believe the lie that they can be, and that this, if this, if, if God's intention for my sexuality doesn't satisfy them, right? If God's wisdom doesn't satisfy me, that, that I can find satisfaction in something else and someone else. And here's the thing, an appetite, when indulged, just grows stronger, right? An appetite, when indulged, just grows stronger. And the wisdom of the proverb says, You have to learn to rule your appetites or your appetites will rule you. So our appetites can be strong. Second, our vision can be blurred. Our vision can be blurred. And here's what I mean by that, that we can develop this idealization of love and marriage, love and and sex, as though it's really going to satisfy me. And this kind of ideal picture actually is part of what gets us off track. Our vision becomes blurred because when we don't experience that ideal, we sometimes pursue a fantasy version, right? When when the ideal doesn't satisfy me, we pursue some kind of fantasy version of it. This is what's in part so alluring about porn. And the statistics about the number of people, both men and women, affected by pornography in in this uh, ever-present online pornography industry is um, astounding. But what's so alluring about it is here it is always available, always willing, all pleasure, no intimacy required. And so people pursue this fantasy. And the more and more and more what we're seeing is that real intimacy is being eroded by people pursuing fantasy. The statistics tell us that teen sex is is down. The, the, The percentage of teens who are having sex has dropped dramatically in recent decades. And in some sense, we would think that's great news. And yet the statistics indicate that part of the reason why teens having sex has dropped so low is because of the ubiquity of online pornography. And it's 
alluring temptation to both men and women, young and old, married and single. People pursue a fantasy. And I've seen it time and again, the way in which this kind of idealized vision of of, um, marriage and sex, of love and sex, blurs people's lines even in ways that lead them into affairs. I remember sitting with a, a person that I had known for a long time, that I admired for a long time, that I'd looked to as a, a kind of a, a spiritual example of the kind of person that I wanted to be. But he found himself in an affair. And the thing was, he was convinced that she was his soulmate. But the reality is, it was a fantasy. He knew the all of the downsides, all of the struggles, all of the things from his marriage, and there was something out here that he thought, this has gotta be better than that. And the pursuit of that fantasy led to all kinds of destruction in the lives of ex-spouses, children, and so many others. The pursuit of fantasy. Our vision gets blurred, and then third, our souls can be shriveled. We look to sexual fulfillment to give us what only God really can. My uh, mentor hero at Dallas Seminary, Prof. Hendricks, the late Prof. Howard Hendricks, once did a study of 246 men in full-time ministry who got involved in sexual infidelity over the course of a 20-month period of time. Right, 246 men who fell into sexual infidelity over the course of about two years. And what he found is as he studied these people in ministry, he found four common characteristics. One, they had no real prayer life, apart from leading other people in prayer. Second, they had no real engagement with the scriptures other than preparing to teach other people. Third, they had no real, authentic community, the kind of community that we talked about before in the video. And then fourth, they all said, I thought it would never happen to me. We find ourselves particularly vulnerable to to sexual temptation when our souls are shriveled, when we're not engaged in feeding our souls, engaged with God in prayer, engaged with the scriptures, engaged in community, and we find ourselves deluded into thinking, that couldn't happen to me. No, the reality is we are all vulnerable. And that leads us to the fourth truth, right? God is good, temptation is powerful, we are vulnerable, but fourth, help is here. Help us here. And for this, we turn to the New Testament, to Paul's words to the church in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, Paul writes to the church in Corinth who was living in a city that was filled with that kind of sexual chaos, confusion, and indulgence. And he says to them, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. And he says, don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God, You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. The first thing Paul says here to to a a church that's trying to live faithfully with their sexuality in the midst of uh, chaos, confusion, and indulgence, he says, flee, right? Run fast, get away, right? That we have to swiftly, immediately, and relentlessly annihilate the stumbling blocks of sexual temptation in your life. And I think there's, There's at least somebody, if maybe not several somebodies that just need to hear that again. We must swiftly, immediately, relentlessly annihilate the stumbling blocks of sexual temptation in your life. Flee sexual immorality. And he says, don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? And friends, for a long time, I heard those words from Paul as though he's saying, don't treat a temple that way. That's not the way you're supposed to treat a temple. And and while there is some truth to that, I think Paul is ultimately getting at a deeper, more profound, and more important truth. He says, don't you know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? In biblical imagination, the temple is the place where the presence of God dwells. And he underscores this reality with two phrases. Your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have received from God. Paul is saying, you have the Holy Spirit in your life. Help is here. 
here's what we must always remember. We are not powerless to change, but we are powerless to change ourselves. We are not powerless to change, but we are powerless to change ourselves when it comes to living in wholeness and holiness with our sexuality. We need a power that is stronger than ourselves, the power of God by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Paul is saying, he's reminding them, you have the empowering presence of God, the Holy Spirit in your life. And so when we find ourselves prone to temptation, when we find ourselves experiencing that vulnerability, we say, Holy Spirit, you are good. Temptation is powerful. I am vulnerable, but you are here. I need your help. I am not powerless to change, but I am powerless to change myself. God has called us to trust him with our sexuality. We will experience temptation, and we are all vulnerable, but help is here. And if there are things in your life that God is using this sermon to kind of turn up inside of you, conviction that the Spirit is dealing with you about, I want to just remind you that one of the most powerful and important ways that the Holy Spirit helps us change It's when we open up to a trusted friend, a faithful pastor, or professional counselor. That when it comes to this powerful area of our lives and and we sometimes find ourselves uh, caught up in the temptation that the Proverbs are warning us about, one of the most powerful and important ways that the Holy Spirit brings about his change in our lives is when we're willing to be honest and open with a trusted friend, a faithful pastor, professional counselor. Friends, God is good. He can be trusted. He can be trusted with our sexuality. God is good, but temptation is powerful. God has given us desires. He's given us these appetites, and we have to recognize that either we learn to control our appetites or our appetites will control us. God is good. Temptation is powerful. We are all vulnerable. All those that fell said, it'll it'll never happen to me. We are all vulnerable, but help is here. We are not powerless to change, but we are powerless to change ourselves. We need a power outside of us that is stronger than us. It is the power of God in the person of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. And I wanna give you just a moment of reflection before we come to partake of communion particularly because I'm aware that when we talk about sexuality, that, that uh, this touches on each of our lives in different ways. And that uh, there may be things this morning that you just need to bring before the Lord. Whether it's uh, the comfort and healing from past hurt, whether it's freedom from a sense of guilt and shame, whether it's the need just to, to confess something in your own heart and life, I'm gonna give you this moment now before we come to communion. Father, we thank you for the beautiful truth of the gospel that I declare over my brothers and sisters here this morning, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit who gives life in Christ Jesus has set us free from the law of sin and death. Thank you. And God, we thank you that as we come to these elements of communion, we can be reminded of the extent to which you were willing to go giving us your son, the extent to which Jesus was willing to go to lay down his life as a sacrifice for us, bearing our sin, bearing our guilt, bearing our shame, and triumphing over it through his resurrection. We thank you and praise you for the truth and the beauty of the gospel this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.